Um, <laughs> it looks like you're still in the same places. Okay, come on up, come on up. Come, 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 come. Don't make me come to you. Okay, as you're moving, there are a few brave souls coming up. This is good. I mean, these are the high-priced seats right up here. You know. Okay, um, let me just say again that um, my wife is with me. She's back here with our dog, by the way, with Cooper. In fact, on the way in, no one said, oh, hi, Steve. They said, is your dog here? <laughs> and so, okay, I get, I get the deal. But my wife and I, we love you guys. And um, Josh knows this is true, that I brag about you. I brag about you as a church in my classes. Um, this is a great church. And God has graced you with, with a pastor and a ministry team that love you. Um, so you're, you're in a good place here this morning. Let me begin with, with a story. Um, uh, my wife and I have, have always had home groups. You know, people, we, we invite people in and we have kind of our small group, whatever you end up call a home group uh, meeting in our home. And it's, just, it's part of just how we do things, and uh, it's always changing, there's a dynamic, you know, people come in, people go out, and all this type of thing, and, and um, uh, it's always uh, a mixture of a lot of different kinds of people, you know, so it's, there's no, everybody's the sameness, they don't all show up in the same car, and look the same, and have the same age, they're all over the, it's all sorts of people in this thing, uh, and uh, at times I do a little recruiting, just saying, and I'm looking around saying, okay, you know, it would be fun to have this person there or this couple there and, and to kind of be part of the dynamic of it. And I could kind of see how they could shape things. And uh, some years ago, there was, there was this, this one couple that, that I was, I was um, courting quite a bit to try and get them in our group uh, because this was a couple that just, they were just the funnest people to be around. You know, they're in our church there, and they were the ones that, that just kind of light up the room when they come in and, and you know, not joke so much as having kind of the, a different take on things. And we all loved it. It was great. And I thought, man, it'd be wonderful to have that couple in our group. And so I, I kind of went after them. And uh, each time I, I got um, turned down. Now, it wasn't like, no, we don't want to come. It was like, oh, we're kind of this other thing going on that night and we can't, you know, we couldn't do that. Okay, fine, I get that. Or, you know, we're... We, we are um, cleaning out our sock drawer, and, you know, we, that's taken up a lot of our time. You know, where it, just, it got to a point where I realized, okay, you really don't want to come. You know, I, whatever it was, there was always a reason for it. So there, there came a point where there was, there was a crisis in their family. And uh, it was, you know, uh, not of them particularly, but it was part of their extended family. There was someone in the hospital, and uh, as a pastor at that time, I, I went and I did what I should, I spent time with the family there, and, and uh, there was this one point where the man and this couple, the husband and I were by ourselves, took the opportunity to, um, to ask him, just more point blank, so what's the deal? Um, how come, I know you're not in a small group, um, why don't you want to come to our group? I mean, is this, have I offended you some way? Um, is there, you know, what's the deal? And in a moment of honesty, where, you know, one of those, those moments where it seems like, like the whole atmosphere shifts a little bit in this thing, and he said, okay, here, here's the thing, Steve. Um, if you really knew us, if you knew our story, if you knew what I've done, you wouldn't want to have us in your group. I, I, can, I can remember feeling the air go out of me. <sighs> I told him, hey, you know, if you knew my story, if you knew what I had done, you wouldn't want me in your group. But it's people like us that Jesus came to save. And if, if you've ever felt like that, if you've ever had even a tinge of that feeling, you're in the right place this morning. 
like to take you into an account in uh, the Gospel of John. So if you have your Bible, kind of make your way to John, because you need to see this as we're going through it. Uh, so it's either, you know, get, get your Bible out or a scoot next to somebody or sync it up on your phone or whatever you got, but make your way to this so that, so that you actually are, are looking into this with me. Uh, and it's at John chapter 4, and uh, where we're going to kind of pick up the account is, is in verse 3. It's talking about Jesus, and, and he's been currently in the, the southern part of what we look at as, as Jerusalem, the southern part of that, and he's going to make his way back up to the northern part. And so it says in verse, you know, chapter 4, verse 3, it says, And he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, so south up to north. And it says, And he had to pass through Samaria. Now, pause for a moment. He didn't have to. In fact, very few Jews ever did. This was kind of like no man's land, a little zone in there, and they would all, they'd make their way around it so that they wouldn't have to go through it. But it says Jesus had to go through this particular region. And the reason he had to, being who he was, he knew something that was going to happen. He had an appointment with someone. And he had to go this way. And I'm sure his disciples all said, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. Where, you know, this, is, this is Samaria. We don't do this. This is kind of no man's land. Um, it's, you know, we're not going to be welcome there. We don't, you know, so, so, but no, I have to go this way. So it says he had to pass through Samaria. And in verse 5 it says, and so he came to uh, a city of Samaria called Sychar near the parcel of ground uh, that Jacob gave his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. Therefore, Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. And there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Let's set this up a little bit. Uh, Jesus comes to this point, and he's, he's wearied. I mean, this, this is a hot season. It's, it's during kind of the harvest time, and it's, it's, uh, it's hot. Um, and they come to this, this well, and Jesus sits under the tree there, and he's relaxed. He sends the, his disciples on into town to kind of set things up and get food and all that kind of stuff. So they're all gone. He's sitting there by himself. Um, and it's a very strategic place there. And you need to understand, in order to get the full impact of the story, you need to understand how strategic this specific location is. And to do that, we'd go all the way back to the um, Old Testament and uh, Deuteronomy, and <coughs> God is speaking, to, uh, speaking through Moses, and, and instructions are given. Now, Moses can't go into the, the land. This, you know, he's, there's reasons for that. But God says, okay, when, when, when you go into this new land... As I bring you, they've come from Egypt, they've wandered 40 years, and now as you go into this land, here's the deal. I want you to go to this specific location and actually tells them geographically, this is the place to go. And when you go there, you're going to find something. Fascinating thing. There are two, what they would call mountains. They're, they're like large hills. You know, uh, in the scriptures, that's kind of the language that's used there. But these two mountains, these two hills that are there. Uh, one is Mount Ebal, the other is Mount Gerizim. I mean, I mean anything yet. Stick with me. These are kind of a geological phenomenon. They're right next to each other, but Mount Ebal is as barren as you could possibly get. There's nothing that grows on it. It's like a big pile of rock there, dead as you can get. Right next to it is Mount Gerizim. Lush, beautiful. It's, it's like, you know, a garden. There's trees. There's, you know, all sorts. There is, you know, animals living in it. And I said, woohoo, this is the place. These are the two mountains. He said, I want you to go to this location. And, and when you get there, I want you to put half the people on one side, half the people on the other side. Uh, half of them are going to be on the bummer side. Half of them are going to be on the lush side. And, and we'll put, I want you to put the, the Ark of the Covenant, the, the symbol of my presence 
and all that is to come in Messiah. Put that in the middle with the priest there. And here's what you do. You're going to be shouting back and forth to each other. Those on Mount Gerizim, the left side, are going to shout all the blessings of knowing the God of your redemption. All that comes with the, with the gospel as we know it. You're going to shout all those wonders of what God brings to, to our lives whenever we step into relationship with Him. They will shout this. On the other side, they will be shouting what are referred to as, as the curses. In other words, what life looks like apart from God. All the ways that life comes apart and goes sideways and all this kind of stuff. And you're going to go back and forth on this, shouting the wonders of knowing God and then the, what, the devastation of not knowing Him back and forth over this covenant here. That's this big deal they were to do. And then you get to the book of Joshua and they actually do it. They come to this place and, and carry this out. And it's a big, a big deal in their history to say this is, this is a turning point for us where we are identifying all that comes with being redeemed by him. That's these two mountains. Uh, It's where Jesus is. And in between them, there is is a a well there called Jacob's Well, uh, which has all its history tied to it. That's that's the location we're talking about. And it says that, that... with this location, there's this woman that comes from this, this town of Sychar and makes her way out to this well, which is outside the city. And, and it says that, that she's coming at the sixth hour. Now, the way um, time was calculated at this point is that you would start counting the hours of the day at six in the morning. Sun coming up makes sense. And so if you kind of move your way through, this is at noon. This is the hottest part of the day. No one comes to the well at this time of day. The way that what you would do is you come in the morning or in the evening where it's cooler. In fact, it'd be a place where everybody would, they'd kind of come out and they'd gather and they didn't have, you know, social media. So this was their social media. They'd come in, they'd say, all the stuff going on, here's what's happening, here's what's going on, hey, did you hear, did you hear? All, the, all the kind of stuff that you find on social media. How it all happened right there. And then at the other end of the day, it happens all again. Hey, here's what happened today, here's the updates, you know, all this kind of stuff going on. But no one comes in the middle of, of the middle of the day. But this woman does. And the reason she comes in the middle of the day is because she is not welcomed in the morning or the evening. She comes at this part of the day because she has been rejected by the community. She is one whose whose life has been devastating. Uh, In fact, her story is probably as as relevant as you can get in the times that we are living right now. Uh, She has been abused. Uh, She has been used. Um... repeatedly. And then all the fallout that probably comes with all of that too. She's got, man, does she drag a story with her. And so she comes at a day where, at a time of day where, where she's hoping nobody will be there. A time where she can make her way there and not have to deal with all that people say when she's around them. The, look, the looks they give her and that type of thing. I can picture her walking her way up through the the wheat fields and and looking at the two mountains up ahead of her and and imagining these two mountains as the possibilities of life. She probably looked at she knew the story she knew all the history behind it and and looking at at the one hill you know Gerizim over here and saying that's the life I wish I had that's the one I dreamed of as a little girl that's the one that I hoped for that's the story I would love to have. But then looking at the other one saying, but that's what I got. This is what my life is like over here. The brokenness, the emptiness, the deadness of life. That's my story. Making her way up through this and picturing these things. And as she comes closer, she sees that there's somebody else there. And I imagine this 
this pace she has probably slows as she starts to come closer. Starts to wonder who's there. And as she makes her way even closer, she sees, she sees that it's a man. And men have been cruel to her. And as she ma- makes her way even closer, she sees that it's not only a man, but it's a Jewish man. I said, well, how does she know that? Well, you know, during this time, you could identify anyone by how they dressed. Jews and Samaritans, Samaritans dressed differently. Um, and there'd be a lot of identifying things just in their clothing and you could see right away. So she sees it's not only a man, but, but it's a Jewish man. And Jewish people have nothing to do with Samaritans. And as she ventures even closer, she sees that it's not only a man and a Jewish man, but it's a kind of a turbo version. It's, it's a rabbi. And I think with each feature of that awareness, she probably slows and tries to anticipate how she's going to navigate this. Then we step back into the story here. Because as she, she comes close, Jesus is the first to speak. Would you give me some water? It's the intro. Would you give me some water? Now, <coughs> I'm guessing that, that this woman had some hard edges. I'm just going to guess. Uh, life, you know, when life is that bad to us, I mean, it, it, kind of that way. And so I don't, I don't think her responses all the way through this are, are soft responses. I can't imagine that her responses are, are gracious responses, but more kind of that mm, type of thing. You know what I'm talking about? A little edge to the thing. Um, and with that opening comment, a whole conversation begins. I'm thinking that the actual conversation was much longer than what we have here. Um, as the gospel writers put these accounts in, uh, I think what they did often was to kind of bring it down to kind of the key pieces rather than giving us the full story, the whole transcript of everything that was said. We start into the conversation here. And and her initial response, when he says, would you give me a drink? Verse 9, it says, the woman therefore said to him, how is it that you, now it probably said more like it, with a little hip out on the side maybe, you know? How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? Another level of things. Men don't talk to women during this time. Since I am a Samaritan woman. And then in parentheses, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. How, how is it that you do this? Kind of the underlying thing is, if you only knew who you were talking to here, do you, realize, do you realize who I am? Do you realize that, that no one talks to me? Do you realize that I'm not just a Samaritan woman, but I am, I'm a broken one for this story? If you only knew, it reminds me of my friend. If you only, if you only knew my story and what I had done. And Jesus, as he so often does, he flips it. He says, if you only knew. If you only knew who who was asking you. And you would ask me not just, you would not only deal with water, but you'd ask me for living water, which sends out a whole new conversation. In fact, it's it's fascinating how Jesus deals with this. When when Jesus is, is meeting with this woman, he does so in a way that's the, same way he does with all of us. He meets us in the midst of our brokenness. Notice that? He doesn't say, okay, clean up your life first, then come to me and we'll figure it out. But rather he steps into life in its mess right into the midst of it and, and offers us something that can change everything in life. He says, if you only knew, you'd ask me for something else. Uh, this woman was was one who had been officially uh, rejected. 
<coughs> came across something years ago that I just checked it out. It's taken off like crazy. It's everywhere now. You familiar with the rejection line? Ever heard of the rejection line? It's really there. Uh, this, the, the number I have is for the New York version. There's, there's actually one in Oakland now. Uh, I think that's the closest one that I could find for you. Uh, I don't have that number. Uh, but the, the uh, rejection line, the New York, they're all the same, really. But uh, that one is, uh, just write it down. You might want this in the future. Um, area code 212-479-7990. Uh, uh, you can ask me afterward, after I tell you more about it, and you go, oh, hey, I, I need that one. Okay. Uh, it, was, it was initially set up for, uh, uh, for, for women who uh, had guys hit on them. And, and they wanted to kind of get them off their back. And so they would they'd say, oh, yeah, here's my number. <laughs> and then when the guy would call, here's what he would hear. Welcome to the New York rejection line. Unfortunately, the person who gave you this number does not want to see you or talk with you ever again. If you would like to take, uh, we would like to take this opportunity to officially reject you. Our certifi- certified, boy, get it right, Steve. Our certified rejection specialists are waiting to serve you in your time of need. Please listen to the following options. If you would like to speak to a comfort specialist, press one. If you would like to hear a sad poem written by a kindred spirit, press two. If you would like to cling to the unrealistic hope that relationship is still possible, press three. I'd I'd like to add another one to it. If if none of those work for you, my dog is here. Um, And Cooper will comfort you. So, I mean, uh, this woman had been officially rejected. Uh, And she knew it. It was part of her whole thing. So as she engages with this conversation with Jesus, it starts out with this living water thing. It's almost like she doesn't get it. She said, if you only knew, and she goes, yeah, whatever, okay, and we move to another topic. And they talk about worship, which is a big deal, because Samaritans weren't, uh, really weren't allowed to come to Jerusalem to worship, and so they kind of made their own place. Guess where they made it? On Mount Gerizim over here. Years and years ago, and, and by the time this conversation takes place, that, that has been abandoned for years, and it's broken down. You can go up there and just see the relics of it. There's just nothing there. And the conversation moves that whole thing. And, and they talk about worship for a while. In fact, some of the coolest stuff about worship shows up in this conversation. And, and she says, yeah, we worship up here. And Jesus goes, yeah, look at that. Uh, and that and, and brings insight into it. It's not the location that deals with this. You're missing the point. But that blows by her too. It's not until he starts to invade her private life that this takes on some life. And she's listening. And he starts to, to kind of press into this thing uh, uh, where, where he asked um, to bring her, you know, bring your husband here. And she says, yeah, um, <laughs> that's not going to work. And he says, yeah, I know it's not going to work. And starts to tell her story. And we just get the clip out of it here. You know, the thing that where, where he says, yeah, the... Um, uh, the one you're living with is, is not even your husband now and kind of goes down that line. But, but somehow this is what changes everything for her. <coughs> because when, when the conversation is over and she leaves, she doesn't leave running back to her, to her village and saying, hey, I found someone who's got living water for us. Nothing about that. She doesn't run back saying, hey, I found someone that has talked about worship and, and a, a new way for us to engage with God. Nothing about that. Instead, she runs back saying, I found someone who told me everything I have ever done. Now think of that for a moment. What if Jesus sat down with you and said, okay, Let's talk about this. I'm going to tell you everything you ever did and the things that go on inside you and your internal thoughts and all. It's all going to be there. Would that be a happy conversation? I mean, think about it. If he, if he sat down with, 
Maybe I could kind of come up nose to nose with each one and say, okay, how, how would you like your story told? Uh, all those secrets that you've got that you thought nobody knew. Well, Jesus does. Uh, all those, those things that go on inside your thoughts and all that stuff that, that you hope never come out. Knows them all. If he sat down with you and said, let's, let's go over your story here. And if, and if what he told was just all the junk in your life, would that be a great conversation? I can't imagine if that happened that you would run out of the building going, hey, have I found a guy for you? Uh, instead, you'd, it'd probably be like the worst conversation you ever had in your life, right? I wonder really what was involved in this conversation that, that made this the turning point for this woman. Because it had to be something, something other than just all the mess. Everybody knew the mess. So, I, as I've thought of this, I realized that there are probably three stories that all run kind of side by side, intermingling here. For this woman and for all of us, there was one story that everybody else told. It was the story that, that when people talked about her, this is the story they would say. Yeah, you know, she's that woman. And they probably talked about her in, <coughs> in the, the, the most unflattering way. Probably talked about her as, as though she was somebody very different from them, although she wasn't. Probably talked about her in terms of maybe like, like she had some disease, and if you got too close to her, then you might catch it. Whenever they talked about it, they probably had sneers on their face or hushed tones or oh, it's just like, oh, that one, that oh. story that other people told about her. We all have that too. I mean, that's that's the one that, that scares the bajillies out of us. Right? I wonder what people are saying about me. What do they really think about me? They can keep you awake at night. That's one story. But there's also another story, and it's the story that she told herself. We all have that too. That's very different from the first one, this one here. Because in the story that we tell ourselves, we, we, we see ourselves usually as a victim. I mean, that's, that's the big, you know, everybody's a victim. I see myself as a victim, and I, I see myself as, as someone who's much better than actually what has happened here. And we, we justify all of our actions and all of our brokenness and all this stuff. You know, that, that's, that really wasn't supposed to happen that way, and it's because of this. And, and you know, there's, there's always that, that, that bit of kind of justifying what has gone on that we tell ourselves, right? Because you have to. Otherwise, you can't move forward. Somehow you have to, you know, have some kind of way of, of describing your own story so that you don't, you know, go out and, and take your life. You know, this, that kind of thing. We don't want to see ourselves. We can't handle the, our, the idea that, that we're as guilty as, as the first story is. We have, we have a gal in our home group uh, that uh, her prayer request for our group this week. Uh, she get citation. It was actually a multiple one where she did this, this, and this, and so she was going to have to go. You know, she was going to go before a judge and ask for leniency, and so she was asking that we'd all pray. And she what she wanted to be able to do was to go to traffic court or to traffic school, and have parts of it kind of eased up. And she wasn't sure if they'd let him. Have you ever been to traffic school? Any, you know, no, don't, don't raise your hand. Just, 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 you just, if you have, just kind of go, mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and there's various versions. You can go online and do it, which takes you a lot longer. But, um, or you can go and do it kind of in one bulk thing. And, and, and yes, I have been to traffic school um, more than once. So, so I, I know how this whole thing works, you know, and, and uh, maybe it's not true in the ones that you've been to, but this, I found this in, in my experiences to be the same in each one, that they, uh, whoever's leading this will, will begin by saying, okay, let's just all kind of own up um, with things here and tell us how, uh, why you're here and how, you know, what happened to you, okay, and we'll start going down the line, and and being kind of the, the way I'm wired, I sit in the back. You know, I'm just one of, those, I'm one of those back sitters. 
And so I'm listening to all these stories as they go through, and I'm realizing there is not one guilty person in the room. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? It's like, well, you know, really the, the speed sign was covered by a bush, so I'm really not guilty. Or um, it was a trap, you know, and I'm, I'm not really, I shouldn't be here. I mean, everybody had stories. And, I, and as we're getting closer to me, I'm realizing I'm going to be the only guilty person in the room. You know, if I say, yeah, it's, uh, there it is. Uh, um, and so <laughs> I find myself saying, well, how can I cast my story in such a way that I'm not quite as guilty? <coughs> but it's the way we do things. It's, it's, how, we, it's how we see ourselves. And, and there's, there's the story that other people say would be the worst version often of, of us. Uh, and then... Uh, there's the version that we tell ourselves, which has, you know, it's filled with justifying things and, and I'm a better person than this and, and recasting our story so that, that, that we're better. Than this. But there's a third story. And I don't think Jesus told either one of the first two. He wasn't buying what other people said. Nope. Mm-mm. He wasn't buying her story either. I believe the, the story that Jesus told when he took her story and said, let me, let me tell you your story, was one that was so different from anything she had ever heard or thought of. It was a story that, that I think included all the blatant reality of everything in her life. You know, no, no softening the edges. It's, no, here, here it is. And yet a story that included the grace and mercy of how God sees us. It was a story in which, uh, I'm, I'm sure, in which she was a much smaller person in the story and yet far more significant than she could even make herself. A story that exposed all the darkness inside of her. And yet a story that was smothered with, with love and grace and mercy. I imagine as Jesus told the story, he told it as a story, as, as, a, as a journey of life of someone pursuing the God of her redemption. A story that brought her to, to the one who loved her more than anyone on earth could ever possibly love her. A story in which all of her dreams found a different take. A story so so amazing that she drops her, her pots and stuff and, and runs back to the village. Got to hear this guy. Huh? I've thought about this, obviously. I've got three stories. There's a story sometimes you know, when people tell my story, I'm a great hero. Woohoo! But I know, not. There are those who tell my story and I'm the worst person that ever crawled the earth. That's that story. There's a story that I like to tell myself in which I, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not so bad. I'm a, I'm a good guy, you know. That's not really me. That was just, that's just, that just happened. Whatever it was. It's a story that I like to say. But I've imagined over and over again what it would be like to sit with Jesus and have him tell my story. Here's, here's, here's really what was going on. As you, as you sought me, as you looked for me, as you looked for something to fill the emptiness, something to deal with, with the brokenness, something uh, uh, to make sense out of all this stuff as you make your way to me and as you continue to follow me. It's only that story. Only that third story, the story that Jesus tells, that makes any sense. A story that is so amazing. Jesus, Jesus desires to meet us in the midst of life as it is. And to offer us life as it could be. He desires to, to take our story and retell it. That's how it shows up in the scriptures. He says, no, that, this, is, this is really how it plays out. And to tell your story, to tell my story, and together to kind of have a collective story. 
of God's great redemption. She doesn't leave saying, I found water. She doesn't leave saying, hey, I know about worship. She leaves saying, you've got to hear this. She runs back to the village. And then it says that. She goes back there and she says, hey, I, I found this guy who told my story. And, <laughs> and they're probably thinking, well, yeah, we all could have told your story. But somehow the way she tells it, the way she's describing this to them, they all come out. In fact, the whole village empties out and they start making their way up this path through the, the wheat fields to find this person. And in fact, it says, we came here because this woman said this. And as, as Jesus is there, the disciples have come back around him. There's this cool part in the storyline here where, you know, starting in verse like 34, it goes down through 38, where, where Jesus um, tells his disciples, look at the harvest. Now, there's two things going on. It's harvest season. There's wheat fields all over the place. But what he's getting at is this crowd of people making their way up the path. Look at the harvest. This morning as you're sitting here, I, I don't know what thoughts rolled through your mind. I got an idea. As we ping some things. But if you're one of those who has been sitting here this morning saying, oh man, if you only knew my story. If you only knew what I've done or what's gone inside me. You wouldn't want me here. You wouldn't want to be close to me. You're the very person that Jesus came to save the very one he wants as close as he can get. You're the one that he desires to retell your story into a story of redemption. As you not only find the God who designed you for himself, the God who sent his son to die so that we might be brought into relationship with him, you're the one he desires to continue developing and continue your story of redemption. You're in the right place. This woman's story is your story and my story. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of being here and of once again just basking in the wonder of, of who you are and what you have done. That you actually love us that you desire, to, desire to, to meet us in the midst of life as it is, again and again, and to be offering us again and again life as it could be, life as you designed it to be, life in relationship with you. So, Father, as, we, as we're here this morning, we ask that you would give us the boldness to come close to you, the willingness to let go of our own story and have you redefine it as your story. We thank you for what you'll do in Jesus' name. Amen.